I'm Dr. Fakhri Robadi and this is Urinary Tract Infections in Adults. The basics are so important. Urinary tract infection is the most common bacterial infection in the ambulatory care setting in the United States. Nearly half of females will develop a UTI in their lifetime, with 25% recurrence within 6 months. And over half of all recurrent UTIs are caused by the same initial bacterial strain that caused the first infection. Pyelonephritis is much less common than cystitis, even in patients with untreated cystitis or untreated asymptomatic bacteriuria. Risk factors for UTIs include sexual intercourse, use of spermicides, previous UTI, a new sex partner, and a history of UTI in a first degree female because there, there are some genetic components into it. Now let's take a look at the anatomy of the urinary tract. So on the left you're looking at the urinary anatomy of the females and on the right you're looking at the urinary anatomy of the males. Note that urethra is what's connected to the bladder so the urine will actually exit the bl bladder through urethra in both uh, females and male. So there's urethra that goes through the penis and is connected to the bladder. And the ureters, the ureters connects the bladder to the kidneys in both uh, female and males. Now in females specifically, the urethra is very close to the rectum. It's very easy for bacterial translocation from the GI. So the GI, so gastrointestinal organisms, can easily translocate to the urethra and then go up to the bladder. So cystitis is much more common in females compared to males. In males, you can see that the opening of the urethra is much further from, uh, from the rectum. So it's much more difficult for translocation of bacteria from, uh, from the rectum all the way to the urethra. Also look at the anatomy. So it's much more difficult for bacteria to travel up the urethra in the males, so therefore uh, urinary tract infections are more common in females compared to male. Another thing to note is that uh, in females, when females get urinary tract infections, uh, the bacteria can oftentimes colonize the vagina, and in males, if males get UTIs, the bacteria can also colonize the prostate, so the prostate is also uh, involved oftentimes when a man gets a urinary tract infection. And in men, the bacteria can also uh, cause infection of the urethra, so urethritis is uh, possible, as well as epididymitis. So epididymis is this area that's connected through the prostate to, to the same uh, pathway. In general, urinary tract infections are divided into two categories. The upper urinary tract infections, which is primarily pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is the infection of the kidneys. And the lower urinary tract infection, which includes cystitis, epididymitis, prostatitis, uh, urethritis. So the bottom three are specifically in men. And cystitis can happen in men and uh, women. Let's take a look at the pathogenesis of urinary tract infection. So as I explained on the previous slide, is that bacteria can oftentimes translocate from the gut, specifically from the rectum, and go through the urethra. And then once they go through the urethra, they can colonize the urine in the bladder. This can cause inflammation and an immune response, specifically neutrophils, which can cause epithelial damage leading to the burning sensation in the bladder. Now for most people, this would be the end and the infection will be resolved. However, for some people, the bacteria can ascend even further. So through the ureters, the bacteria can actually ascend all the way up to the kidneys and they can actually colonize the kidney tissue, resulting in inflammation and damage to the kidney. There are a lot of vasculature in the nephrons, so the bacteria can easily get into the blood. And that could lead to bacteremia or infection in the blood. In general, there are three ways to get urinary tract infection. The first way to get urinary tract infection is through the ascending pathway, which I just described with the bacteria uh, translocating from the gut to the urethra and ascending to the uh, bladder and then to the kidneys and eventually to the blood. 
Another way is if the bacteria actually come from the blood. So if somebody has bloodstream infection, because the blood goes through the kidneys, the bacteria can actually go from the blood to the kidneys and then from the kidneys to the bladder, causing cystitis. And the third way of getting urinary tract infection is actually through the lymphatic system. The lymphatic uh, pathway is not as common. In fact, the evidence for it is actually from animal studies. Now let's take a look at reliable resources. IDSA is the Infectious Diseases Society of America. It's the organization in the United States that develops clinical practice guidelines for infectious diseases. The first guideline that you should be aware of is the 2009 IDSA guidelines for catheter-associated urinary tract infections in adults. This is the guideline that clinicians typically refer to for complicated UTIs. The second guideline is the 2010 IDSA guidelines for acute uncomplicated cystitis and pyelonephritis in women. The third one is the 2016 IDSA guidelines for candidiasis. This guideline includes recommendations for candiduria, which is the urinary infection caused by candida, which are fungal infections. You will learn about fungal infections on a different topic. And the last one is the 2019 IDSA guidelines for asymptomatic bacteriuria that were released just a few months ago. The first learning objective is describe the pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of antibiotics used for UTIs. Let's take a look at some anti-infective agents that are commonly used for the management of UTI. Historically, fluoroquinolones have been uh, frequently used for UTIs. So ciprofloxacin is one of the commonly used fluoroquinolones. The mechanism of action of fluoroquinolones involves inhibition of bacterial DNA synthesis resulting in rapid bacterial cell death. And this happens by inhibition of two different enzymes. So they can inhibit DNA gyrase, often in gram-negative bacteria. They can also inhibit topoisomerase 4, often in gram-positive bacteria which results in DNA synthesis interruption. Fluoroquinolones are available as PO and IV for the most part, which can be used for UTIs. Now, there are other formulations, for example, ear drops, eye drops that uh, are not covered in this topic. Phosphomycin is only available as oral in the United States currently, and an IV formulation is under development. And the way it works is that it inhibits MUR-A, which essentially inhibits initial step in bacterial cell wall synthesis. Nitrofurantoin is also only available as an oral option, and there are three proposed mechanisms of actions for it, which include inhibition of ribosomal translation, bacterial DNA damage, or interference with the Krebs cycle, or citric acid cycle. Finally, we have the combination of trimethoferin, sulfamethoxazole, which together are available as both oral and IV, which are used commonly for the treatment of UTIs. And the way they work is that sulfonamides inhibit the formation of dihydrofolic acid, and trimethoferin prevents the next step, which would be the synthesis of tetrahydrofolic acid, which in turn inhibits DNA synthesis. Let's take a look at the adverse effects of these antibiotics. Trimethoprim can lead to anemia, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, hyperkalemia, and hyponatremia. And hyperkalemia is something that occurs in clinical practice often and is something to monitor with patients. Trimethoprim can also inhibit the secretion of serum creatinine in the kidneys, which means that artificially serum creatinine will be increased, but doesn't necessarily mean nephrotoxicity. Sulfamethoxazole, however, can cause nephrotoxicity. So because these two come together, so together this combination is considered nephrotoxic. And sulfamethoxazole, which is a sulfa drug, that component can cause rash, photosensitivity. It can also cause GI upset like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, as well as hepatitis, anemia, thrombocytopenia. And it is recommended that the patients actually take this combination with at least 8 fluid ounces of water in order to avoid formation of uh, crystals in the kidneys in order to avoid uh, or at least reduce the risk of nephrotoxicity. It is also advised 
for the patients to use sunscreen and avoid tanning beds because of the photosensitivity. Nitrofurantoin can also cause GI disturbances as well as CNS, CNS effects such as headache and drowsiness. It can also lead to allergic reactions that, which, that often uh, present as leukopenia, granulocytopenia, eosinophilia, and hemolytic anemia. And hemolytic anemia is uh, often present in people with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. It can also cause peripheral neuropathy, interstitial pneumonitis, and it can also make the urine color change to brownish color. And with chronic use, it can also cause pulmonary fibrosis. Lastly, it can cause hyperkalemia. It is recommended that nitrofurantone be taken with food to improve absorption and avoid con con concurrent magnesium products, which can reduce the absorption. Phosphomycin is currently available as oral and it comes in packets that include powder and the patients need to mix it with three to four fluid ounces of cool water. So it should not be done in uh, hot water. And it can cause diarrhea, nausea, headache, vaginitis, as well as dizziness, abdominal pain, as well as rash. Now, a lot of bad things happen with uh, fluoroquinolones in general. So let's focus on ciprofloxacin. So with ciprofloxacin, like many antibiotics, GI disturbances can occur. So nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. But with fluoroquinolones, you can also have CNS effects like headache, dizziness, hallucination, delirium. And in some cases, seizures have happened, including in patients who had underlying uh, neurological disorders uh, and also like patients who uh, were taking NSAIDs. So NSAIDs can increase the risk of having seizures with fluoroquinolones. Uh, there's also been reports of peripheral neuropathy that may be irreversible, as well as arthralgia and joint pain, tendon rupture or tendonitis. And these basically occur mostly in uh, elderly patients over the age of 60. They are at high risk. Fluoroquinolones can also uh, lead to QTC prolongation. Uh, now, ciprofloxacin has the lowest risk compared to other fluoroquinolones, uh, but the risk still exists. It can also cause rash and photosensitivity. It is recommended that patients avoid taking any dairy products. So anything that includes a, a cation such as calcium should be avoided. So they should be separated uh, by at least two hours. And just as in uh, any product that causes photosensitivity, patients should use sunscreen and avoid uh, tanning beds and avoid excessive exposure to sun. Uh, here are the formulation for natrofurantoin. So back in 1952, when we first came up with natrofurantoin, it was uh, in macro uh, crystalline uh, formulation. It had really good absorption, but it also had increased uh, GI effects, adverse effects which led us to uh, developing a macrocrystalline uh, formulation. This improved the GI adverse effect, but uh, the absorption wasn't as good. So that's why with uh, macrocrystalline, we have to dose it four times a day because it's not absorbed. So you have to do it multiple times throughout the day. Until um, later, uh, we actually, when, when we develop macrobed, that's a combination of macrocrystalline and macrocrystalline. So you know, improves absorption and also improves uh, GI adverse effects. And this is dosed twice a day. So 100 milligram, two times a day. And here's the spectrum of coverage of uh, natrofurantone and phosphomycin. So they do cover enterococcus, which you would suspect in, um, in uh, UTIs as well as VREs. They also cover VRE. And also they have good coverage for E. coli. So that's why these two are excellent agents uh, to use in cystitis. And resistance rate has not increased over the years. Because there are different formulations of natrofurantoin, and if, you if you're if you working with the generic, it just says natrofurantoin on it. So it's important to be able, as pharmacists, to distinguish between the two formulations. So as you can see, choice A, it actually t tells you that it, this is a monohydrate uh, macrocrystals combination, whereas the second uh, is just macrocrystals. So this question is which is the generic for macro bit, the, uh, the correct answer would be A. Uh, it also tells you here, so A is macro bit, it tell, says that it's dosed twice a day, uh, take it with food, whereas uh, the second option it tells you, let's see, uh, QID, so four times a day with food. 
So that's how you know uh, choice A uh, is macro. So as pharmacists, you should be aware of, you know, if the doctor wrote for macro, we don't dispense uh, the second option, especially if the you know, instruction says take, uh, you know, one pill twice a day, you do not want to give them this because it's not going to be absorbed as much and you're going to have failure, uh, treatment failure. Now let's take a look at sulfonamide allergy, which is often referred to as sulfa allergy. Now about three to 8% of patients report experience with sulfonamide allergies. And in general, all sulfonamides, which can be divided in sulfonamide antibiotics and sulfonamide non-antibiotic agents, they basically all contain a, a sulfa moiety. And then sulfonamide uh, antibiotics also contain additional substitutions at N1 and N4 uh, positions. And the evidence currently suggests that su these substitutions at N1 and N4 are the primary determinants of drug allergy instead of the common sulfonamide moiety. So based on the evidence uh, that's available currently, there is a very low risk of cross allergenicity between sulfonamide antibiotics and non-antibiotic agents. So when you hear a patient have a sulfa allergy, you should determine if it was due to a antibiotics uh, sulfonamide or a non-antibiotic sulfonamide. And in general, sulfonamide non-antibiotic agents include loop diuretics like uh, furosemide, uh, thiazide diuretics, so hydrochlorothiazide, for example, uh, sulfonylureas, uh, triptans uh, that are used for uh, migraine, acetazolamide, uh, silicoxib, which is a COX-2 inhibitor, as well as some protease inhibitors for HIV, uh, such as darunavir. And sulfonamide antibiotics, for the most part, include uh, sulfamethoxazole, uh, which we use for uh, UTIs in combination with uh, trimethoprim, but there's also uh, sulfadiazine as well as uh, sulfasalazine. So rechallenge and desensitization strategies may be appropriate for patients with sulfonamide allergy uh, with delayed macropapular eruptions, but alternative treatment options are uh, more appropriate for patients with severe infections.